Um, I want to start by summoning into this space uh, a person who might have been quite surprised to see us all here, and including me. My grandfather, his name was Jack, and he was a miner uh, in Asla Green Colliery, which if you go into 20 miles along the East Lanks Road, you will see still it's the only colliery winding gear still left in Lancashire. And he, was, he worked down there from the age of 14 until he retired with uh, lung disease at the age of 57. Um, one day, he was w- in the 30s, he was walking down his street. Um, he lived in a, a very small slum-like house. And he saw a member of the British Union of Fascists in a uniform park his car and go into a chip shop to buy some chips. He went into the shop and threw the member of the British Union of Fascists through the chip shop window. <laughs> Why? This guy was a Christian, a lifelong opponent of the left in the Labour movement, never a Labour member, sub-political, sub-literate. But he understood that all the strength that came to him and his community and his workplace, which largely was consisted of excluding people, excluding bosses, throwing stones at people you didn't recognise in the street. That's what children did in working class communities. Um, of setting an agenda in the coal mine so that new people were not brought in to undermine wages. He understood, his generation understood, that all of that strength could so easily be turned against them if it were turned against Jews, ethnic minorities, communists, though he didn't agree with communism. He lived in an era where that was a real threat, and so do we. I've been privileged to, because I'm reviewing it, to see um, Paul Greengrass's new film about the Anders Breivik massacre on the the island of Utøya of of 69 of our comrades, the Norwegian Labour Party. Um, And came out of that film very sad, it's a very sad and moving film, and wanting to smash fascism. Uh, And both of those emotions are logical. Because we we do face face a, a, a real threat now, and the threat is... Many of these far-right groups in in Europe and America are not fascist, but the problem is they don't need fascism to achieve what they achieved in the 30s because people like my granddad no longer exist. They needed fascism to smash the most organised, the most politically conscious generation, the working class in its 200-year history, 250 years is really all we've had in this space here in northwest England. They don't need fascism because that generation is gone. Now, uh, what made my granddad, within 10 years, achieve what? Nationalisation, health service. You know, the world into which his his generation then emerged within 10 years with the Atlee government, what made them able to carry out that transformation was belief in a project which they could all share. And much though I stand on the left and Labour movement and I'm identified as a critical supporter of Jeremy Corbyn, what I think we need to achieve is a project that many people with many different viewpoints and interests as well can sign up to. And I don't call that project socialism, or you may feel free to do so, and I certainly do not call it communism because I think the negative connotations, I've spent half a year travelling from Poland, Croatia, East Germany, sorry, much though what I'm about to outline would, would look like what Marx originally thought by communism, I just don't think it's helpful to use the word. We, on the left, are very utilitarian. We'll say things like, um, you know, inequality is bad because it, it suppresses productivity or things, you know. No, inequality is bad. What neoliberalism has done to our class and our people is bad because it is immoral. And what I am in favour of, you may know I've written a book called Post-Capitalism, but but another word for post-capitalism would be a moral economy. And the tradition of the moral economy is actually very strong in our movement, going right back to Tawney, uh, right through Polanyi, right through E.P. Thompson, to, I hope you'll identify, many of us on the left today. That's what we want. Now, for me, what it consists of is not a series of piecemeal reforms, and it certainly does not consist of, and I am worried about what I think uh, is a trend within some of the thinking, but in the sort of left and centre-left of this party, it does not consist of the revival of Stalinism combined with Fabianism. Because both of, both of these were top-down ideologies which said to my granddad, basically either, you know, in its Stalinist variant, you obey, 
or we will do stuff for you. You know, here, here you are, you chaotic, useless people. Uh, we, the Labour Party, deliver things to you. For me, the project of a moral economy, a transition not simply beyond the neoliberal model of capitalism, but in this century beyond capitalism itself, involves just doing four simple things. The first one is a no-brainer. We stop climate change. And we stop climate change, I'm sorry to some of my comrades in the trade union movement who find it difficult, by stopping extracting and using carbon. That's how we do it. And we make changes to the economy in that way. The second thing is, under, under acknowledged inside this movement, we stop depleting the resources of the planet. We move to a circular economy where we extract as few uh, resources from, from the planet in the form of raw materials as possible and design in reusability. The third thing is, we move to a highly automated, low work economy. Well, who's that a challenge to? The entire Marxist-influenced, right-wing labour-influenced, trade union-influenced tradition that sees work or socialism as a utopia based on work. As the French Marxist André Gort says, we have to leave behind the idea of a, so of a utopia based on work because it, there won't be enough work for us to do. High automation, low work... What does that mean? That means we have to rearrange the social relations of society to accommodate that, to, make, to move some of the activities we do beyond the market and beyond even the state provision, which is always paid for by the market being taxed. We have to move to a peer-to-peer -peer economy. We have to move to uh, unmanaged, unowned forms of economics that are very well pioneered, both in Europe and America, both in you know, open source software or in, in, the, in the, you know, just simply in, in the, the social economy movements in Scandinavia and, and Germany. We can make out of this a synthesis, and I will finish on this. My granddad, you know, worked in a mine. You know, it, it, the, the, the form of exploitation that, that, that he, ex, the, the, how did rich people get rich from him was through his labour. How do rich people get rich from us? How do they extract a surplus? is not only through our labour, even at this stage of capitalism. It is through what the Italian Marxist Mario Tronzi called the social factory. The capitalist earning the most from you is the person who owns your credit card debt, 18%. The capitalist earning the most from poor people here on Merseyside is the shop that sells you a fridge at 1,000% interest. Compared to that, the average 10% return on equity of, se of, a, of, a, of a mature business, say like BMW or Airbus, is puny. Who, you, even Airbus and BMW are ultimately the exploited by the finance system. So what do we need to do? S see, to my granddad's generation, it was clear who the bosses were. You see their car, you trash it secretly. That's what you do. <laughs> there, you can't see your, the exploiter who makes the money out of you. That's, it, the money is going straight to the Cayman Islands. It's got, uh, the, all these buildings in Liverpool owned by Chinese or Hong Kong or Indian or Saudi you know, property companies. That's who's exploiting you. And therefore, you have to be intelligent in a way that, that wasn't such a problem. Well, they didn't have to be literate, really, even to be a socialist in, in, in the 30s. It helped. But there's an advantage. And I can't think of a better way of putting it than the distinctly non-Labour Party uh, people who wrote uh, The Coming Insurrection in 2007, the, 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 this in Committee of Anarchists. And it said this. Our grandfathers had the factory space in which to find each other, work out who the scabs were, and overcome their resistance. We have the whole of society. The society is our factory floor, and this is what makes it possible for our movement to be hegemonic. Yes, to reach beyond workers, to be, reach beyond the factory, and, and for labour to be a, not simply a party but a social movement. And that is the vision of, in seven or eight minutes, the, the clearest vision I could think of, of the kind of movement we could build to honour, not, not only honour what our grandfathers built, but also to defend what they built in the here and now, which is what is left of the welfare state, what is left of dem democracy, and what is left of internationalism and global solidarity. Thank you.